So I am so gratified to see you all here. This has been a, uh, a labor of love for me to get involved in this, and, and um, I, I really think we are going to add some, um, uh, some value to all of us, and I, I include myself. I mean, part of the reason why I started this is, is I, I need to have a plan. I didn't know how to go about getting started, what all was needed. So I've, I've learned uh, so much during this, and I hope we'll be able to share that. Now, I would also say that today, what we are doing is we are talking about why do you need a plan, what should be in the plan, and how to go about getting organized to putting a plan together. The, the meat, the expertise will come over the next three weeks when we have Joe Lynch of Lana Lawyers here next week to talk about wills. Uh, the following week he will talk about living wills and kind of health-related legal documents, along with Heather Smith who will talk about end-of-life health care options and then the fourth meeting, the kind of, you know, what happens when the time comes, when you have to put your plan into execution mode. So that's, um, that's where the meat of it will all be. But that today sort of sets the stage so we'll be ready for that knowledge. I went too fast. All right. So I thought it was worthwhile to think um, and, and part of this came about, I, I made a little brief presentation about this event at the last um, uh, expats club general meeting. And the guy who followed me, and I just did like a quick five minutes, the guy that followed me said, wow, that wasn't very uplifting. And I, th and I thought about that for a while. And yeah, I can see why people would think that. But on the other hand, you know, the, the longest journey begins with a single step. And I think that the fact that all of you have taken that first step to be here today, first of all, I'm, I'm honored that you did. And then secondly, what that says is that, you know, this group knows how important this is. This group decided to, you know, get up off their hands and actually make something happen. And so I would say congratulations to all of you for that. And that really is uplifting. I mean, when, when we, again, I'm in the same boat, when we have our plan done, things are organized, things are ready to go, hopefully it'll be 50 more years before we need them, but you'll feel good about it, I'll feel good about it, and that really, that is uplifting. So I, I feel very happy about that. As far as the need, I'm not going to explore too much of this because you guys, again, made it happen. But after I started working in this program, I literally asked anyone I came in contact with, hey, do you have a plan? I, the, I've asked over 150 people. That's how many? Eight. Eight people said yes. Interestingly enough, and I, I won't out, any, the current word is dox, I won't dox anyone here, but at least two of the eight are in this room today, which I, I feel the pressure, I gotta tell you. I, I, I hope that they will tell me when it's all over, hey, you did okay, kid. Uh, but here's what I hope all of you will do, is if you get something out of this program, which I am confident that you will. I hope you'll ask your own 150 people, and for the ones that haven't yet started, give, some, give them some encouragement to also get started, because the one thing we know, if we don't start it, we won't finish it. So what are we gonna do today? We're gonna try to answer the question, why do we need a plan? What are the elements of the plan? What's in the plan? how to go about assembling the plan, and then that'll set the stage for the following three presentations. And then we, just like all of the four, we have designed them to be one hour of discussion and presentation and 30 minutes, a full 30 minutes of, of Q&A. So we'll start that today, so hopefully we will be able to, um, uh, to get, to answer everyone's questions 
why plan? Th th this is probably the simplest distillation that I could think of. Our mom really was right when, when she said, don't leave a mess. And I have heard so many stories of people who didn't have a plan, maybe didn't even think they needed a plan. Maybe they were in the it won't matter, I'll be gone club. Speaking of your mom, she's calling. Um, we really all need a plan. It, it is the, the stories I've heard of family members getting a surprise call 8,000 miles away and not knowing what to do and getting on the most expensive flight there is, which is the one the next day, and coming here and then having no clue what to do. These are things we, we can avoid that. And the, again, the, I won't go too much into it because you guys actually took the time to decide to do something about it. So I'm not gonna lecture you at all. This is the only really busy chart on this presentation, um, thankfully, but I'm actually gonna go through it because it's sort of important. So maybe I'll do it from this angle. So we're in chronological order. What we wanna make sure of is that the plan covers, it, it, the whole idea of the plan is that so when the time comes, things will happen the way we want them to happen. And that starts with our health care. So we all probably have some idea from loved ones or parents or grandparents who were in an end of life situation and you know certain decisions have to be made. You know, do you want to, you know, heroic measures to keep someone alive as long as you possibly can? Do you want to just nourish someone and keep them comfortable and let them pass as peaceably as possible, somewhere in between. But the idea is for all of us, we want to be able to make those decisions. Sadly, sometimes the, when the time comes, we're not, uh, we're not able to do that. We're incapacitated. Um, so now part of, the, of this planning process is determining who do I trust to communicate my wishes, and then what legal basis does that person have to represent my wishes to the, the healthcare system? So healthcare is a big deal. Um, it, it's also, and we'll get to this a little bit, but there are, it's really hard. I, I mean, I remember when my, when my mother passed, she had, she had advanced COPD, so she was conscious she was not in pain right up until the very end and she had a living will and there there came a point where do you put someone on a ventilator or not my mother was very very clear what she wanted in those circumstances it was documented in a living will at the time however my sister my younger sister it was really hard for her to go along with my mother's wishes. Having that document to clarify and codify the, what her wishes were was the thing that made sure that her wishes were followed. And even more so here because the cultural norm here is to do everything that one can to keep someone going. And nothing wrong with that, no judgment. If that's what you want, great. But if it's not what you want, you want to make sure it's documented. We also want to make sure that we communicate what are our funeral arrangements. Do we want to be cremated and, you know, Thai style? In a, in a temple, 
and have the three-day monk's funeral? Do we want a lay funeral? Do we want to be buried? And again, wh whatever you want, you, you should be able to do, and you should be able to make that choice. So we're going to make sure to tell you how you can make those choices and make them stick. The how to avoid adding burden is really very simple. Just um, imagine, if you will, that someone called you from a foreign country 8,000 miles away. You'd never been there. And you were called to say that you needed to make the arrangements for this person. You have no idea where their bank accounts are, what, uh, what relationships they had, what property they own. But you, you're expected to go get on a plane and go figure it out. All the while, you're not feeling really good because this is someone that you care about. So that's what I mean by adding to the burden. We want, if the people that are gonna be involved in this, wouldn't it be nice if we gave them a fully fleshed out plan so that they don't have to feel that added pressure of wondering what to do? We're gonna, I'm aware that many of us, very, very few of us have unlimited resources. Um, for the rest of us that don't have unlimited resources, it would be really nice if we could accomplish all these things without spending a boatload of money. So throughout this process, I and we who are presenting will try very hard to give you some very practical tips to make sure that you are kind of controlling the costs of this process. And how do you do that? I mean, part of it's really very simple. It is typically lawyers that will help with wills, with living wills, and probate, and finding an executor, and those kinds of things. And so how uh, those folks tend to charge based on the value of their time. And so the way that we can help them to accomplish what they need to accomplish in the least amount of time possible is for us to be as organized as we can so that when we go in and talk to them, that we are organized, we are able to lay out what it is we think we want, and then it'll be a much more efficient process. So we're gonna try really hard to keep these costs down and, and to give you tips for how to do that. This G here has, has been amazing, and I'm, I'm laughing because every time I sort of think I've got a handle on the list of things, I find 22 more, but clearly all of us you know, have a bank account or two. We may have a lease, we may have a, a motorbike or a car. Um, so understanding how to deal with these things once we're gone and helping people, passwords, social media accounts, online mm -hmm. accounts. Um, Again, this is not rocket science, but unless we think about it and plan for it, it just you know, can become a bigger issue than it needs to be. All right, I promise this will be the last wordy chart. Um, legal and cultural issues. I, I, um, we aren't in Kansas anymore, and uh, forgive me, th th are, is the Wizard of Oz strictly a United States movie? People from Australia and the UK, everyone see it? No, know what I'm talking about? I guess, I guess not, okay. Sorry, I thought everyone would know what this was. All right, the, the, uh, the, the, this line is from a movie called The Wizard of Oz. It's uh, quite famous, it's, although it's, it is old, it's our generation old. And the, the, uh, it, this iconic phrase is used when we find ourselves in a circumstance of, wow, this isn't what I'm used to at all. And there certainly are, it's no surprise that to any of you, that some things are very different here culturally. And I will also say legally, and Joe Lynch will get in much more about this when he talks about uh, wills next week. But from a cultural standpoint, well, I guess to my own organization, we'll start with the legal differences. So in, in the places where a lot of us are from, 
if you die without a will, your spouse is presumed to inherit basically everything. That's not necessarily the case here. And again, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because this is not my expertise. This is Joe's, and he'll get to that next week. But you could see how this would be a problem if, you're, if, if any of us are assuming someone will inherit. And so, gee, I don't need to worry about it. But the truth is that that's not the case. I, I, I for one, would want to know that up front. In Thailand, your spouse and or loved ones may have absolutely zero influence on your medical treatment without a living will. Again, may or may not be an issue, but if it is, you want to make sure it's covered on the front end. An interesting gotcha that I discovered during this is let's say that a one of us Barangs owns a house or a condo via a, a spouse, a Thai spouse. All great and, and we have it perfectly planned that if I die my spouse is going to maintain that property and all good. The gotcha is that often Thai spouses don't have a will. And if the Thai spouse were to die early, before we do, we may lose the rights to that house that we have bought. Again, a very easy problem to correct but only if we're aware of it. We can't correct something we don't know about. And then, of course, for uh, same-sex couples, this is a, a kind of a rapidly evolving landscape here in Thailand, but same-sex couples do not have all of the same rights that, um, that are prevalent in other countries. So again, important to understand. Cultural differences. Um, Heather Smith, who will be talking in the third and fourth sessions, explained this to me. Again, brand new information to me. She explained that often that the Thai, our Thai loved ones are under tremendous, or can be under tremendous cultural pressure to A, keep us alive at all costs because that shows how much they love us, right? So it's, it, again, that's their culture. So again, fine if that's, especially if that's your decision, but if it's not, you can certainly burn through a lot of money doing this when there really was nothing that could be done in the first place. So to give our Thai loved ones the legal, kind of the legal documentation that says what we want, will allow them to escape some of this cultural pressure that may, may be existent. Related issue, it is um, often considered the same show of love by a Thai spouse or Thai loved ones to make sure that we have the grandest, beautiful, most elaborate, parentheses, expensive, um, funerals that we can get because that proves to everyone how much we were loved. Again, if that's what you want, great. But if you'd rather that your Thai loved one or your relatives or somebody else have access to those funds that otherwise would be used for this extravagant funeral, then you may want to give your Thai loved ones the kind of cover to do that by making your uh, wishes expressly known. I put this up here only to tell you that we're not going to talk about it. Um, one, one would reasonably assume that financial planning is part of, of, of end of life plans. However, in, I made an assumption that the, the people with 80 bazillions of, choose your monetary unit of measure here, um, will probably already have 
those issues you know, taken care of. If not, see me later and I'll be happy to talk to you. Um, so my assumption is that we are not talking to a bunch of bazillionaires here. And so I would just say, talk to your financial prof uh, professional. And you know, certainly uh, there are some very good ones in Chiang Mai. Um, at least a couple of them are sponsors of the expats club. So feel free to seek them out. But the, the actual financial planning, investments, trust vehicles are not going to be a big part of this uh, four series presentation. We, we tend to not think a whole lot about emotional and psychological preparation. And, you know, unless you're in a situ situation like my mom was where, you know, we, we sort of had a two month window where between the time we found out about this COPD wasn't going to go away and when she passed away. So we were kind of in a crucible and could talk about everything. It was, it was I, I couldn't have asked for a better experience. I, I took a leave from my job running a technology company and spent those two months with her and we talked about everything and looked at all the pictures and the junk drawers and all that stuff. That doesn't often happen that way. And one part of this discussion is to encourage all of us to have you know, these conversations become a lot less uncomfortable if we talk about them with people, right? I mean, it, it, this is all you know, part of the circle of life. And if we talk about it with our friends and our loved ones, um, a, a good example of that would be later you're going to hear about you know, wills. And uh, when you have a will, you need some, something called an executor. And that's just the person who makes sure that what's in the will actually gets carried out. Uh, and so for many of us here, if we were going to find someone that we trust and someone that we think is competent to be our executor, it may very well be within our circle of friends. Again, be probably nice to talk. So if Christine right there, if she is going to be my executor, probably makes a whole lot of sense for Christine and I to sit down and chat about what's in my will, um, you know, understanding what my wishes are, see if she has any concerns, and if, see if she knows how to accomplish what we want to accomplish. So again, good idea to talk to people. And once we do, we find that you know, it gets much easier. People that have a significant religious orientation in their life, I have found a, a very interesting circle of clergy, whether it's Jewish, Christian, Baptist, non-denominational, Buddhist, there are very, very good folks around, and um, and and you know my encouragement is to talk to these folks kind of ahead of time because they, they all have experience with their parishioners passing away. They will all know the norms of that particular religious affiliation. Um, so. Certainly for some religions, it's very important to be buried within a very short period of time. Um, others have other very significant um, considerations. So um, if, if anyone, oh, by the way, anyone that doesn't know, the, my email address regarding this event is media at chiangmaiexpatsclub.com. So anytime you have a question or if you, for example, say, okay, Rick, I heard you talk about the religious things. I am Jewish. Can you point me in the right direction? Happy to do it. If you have, um, if you want to make sure that some particular issue is covered, send me an email. Um, if I'm not talking loud enough and you want me to talk louder or the next person to talk louder, let me know. Uh, but that email, that email will get directly to me. Media at Chiang Mai Expats Club, plural, expatsclub.com. Also, I, I see one other thing. So, show, show of hands, how, how many people live by themselves? All right, so that's a significant number. Um, 
the lady that I've already pointed to once before, so I guess she's my co-star apparently now, whether she wants to be or not, <laughs> um, started a line group, which she calls I'm OK. And this is the simplest thing ever created. So what Christine's group I'm OK does, for it's designed for people that live alone and how she has designed it, and yell at me if I get this wrong. That it, let's, let's say I, I don't live alone, but if I did, so I would, I would start this group, and every morning, I, all I would do is just get on the line group, and I'd say, I'm OK. Now, the magic is that I also, in order to make this effective, I need to have talked to one or two other people who will look at that every day and see that I've said I'm OK. And that the people with whom I talk to to monitor this also know what to do, because we've talked about it, what to do if I don't say I'm OK. And that can be whatever you want it to be. So there is no functionality in this group. There is no, nothing that automatically happens. It's just something that should you wish to take advantage of it, you may. And um, Christine's now been doing this for, what, four months now? And, um, and it is working very well for the people that are involved. So if, um, again, send, either send me an email. I won't sick anybody on Christine. But if you send me an email, and we'll make sure you know how to get access to this line group. Again, it's designed for people that live alone. Um, and uh, so if I haven't explained it well enough or you have any questions, shoot me an email. All right. What should be in your plan? So we talked a little bit. Sorry, I didn't get the microphone. We talked about the health care issues. So one of the things if we start, again, this in chronological order, many of us will have need for some end of care or end of life health care. So whether that's, we, we had some catastrophic, catastrophic, um, catastrophic event, you know, like an accident or a stroke or something, or we just got pneumonia or whatever and we're in the hospital. But these are times when often the decisions will have um, you know, real like meaningful consequences. And again, we want to be the ones to make sure that we're calling the shots, which we can only do either if we have all our faculties or if we have authorized someone else to make those decisions for us, hopefully because we have talked about our wishes with that person, and we can be confident that they will tell the whoever the doctors or medical people are what our wishes are. So that happens via a document in Thailand. It's called a living will. And again, Joe Lynch will talk in much more specific detail about it. But for right now, just understand that ensuring you are treated the way you want to be treated. And that's the key to all of this, is having things go according to your wishes, right? So the way to do that in terms of medical care is with a living will. And again, Joe will, uh, will walk you through all the details of this in week three. So. Healthcare directive, and I think Joe actually has a document that um, he will make available either today or next week, which is called like the, the three important documents or something like that. And so, of the three, you know, the the living will is one, uh, will is the second one, and I'll let him take it from there. But so, the the will is that legal document that kind of specifies all of this, you know, here's how I would like it to play out. Um, you know, here, here's what, what I own, where it goes, to whom, and what percentages, those kinds of things. Um, and 
I've set up here, and I, I made this up, so if this is really bad, it's all on me. A, a will is really two parts. It's your wishes, and then it's what I've come to call the magic decoder ring. And the magic decoder ring really involves the fact that a will that does not meet the requirements of the jurisdiction or the location where it's supposed to be effective will be ruled to be non-existent. So if you have a will that's not been prepared according to the local rules, then it's the same as if you died without a will. So it is, it is not, none of this again is rocket science or as we say, rocket surgery. But it is important that it be done right. So whether you try to do it yourself, whether you have an attorney do it, not all attorneys will do a great job. You wanna make sure to know enough that you'll be confident that yours is done properly. That's the key element there. One of the things that I learned from the people with whom I spoke who did have a plan is that all of them, every single one, all, all of the 5% had a repository of their important documents. So in one place, and they're findable. Uh, again, doesn't do a whole lot of good if the first responders are coming into your place looking for information and your stuff is in a bank vault. Right? It doesn't help anybody. So the idea here is to make sure that you have all the information that people are going to need and it's somewhere that it can be found. This will also help talk about, every, and again, it's thing, even, even if you're not ready to die, you know, you're, let, let's say that you were in an accident and you're just unconscious for several hours, right? So all the things your doctor would want to know, what kind of medication do you want? Who's your doctor? What kind of health insurance you got? So it'd be nice if people could find these things real quickly. So I'm gonna pick on someone else now other than Christine. So Frank right here was kind enough to, uh, to help me answer this question. Wouldn't it be nice if there was some kind of easy checklist? I'm sorry, what, what, what? <coughs> Checklist. What did I say? Did I say something different? Anyway, this beautiful document, this checklist, was uh, made beautiful by this man right here, Frank. And actually, since Frank, I've already called you out. Would you help me? We're going to make sure that everybody has one of these. So now you will have a, a checklist. Oh, Frank's gonna get help. So now see, no one leaves empty handed. In addition, Frank also helped me with this. You're not gonna get this today. I gotta make sure you come back. So th this one, this one's very cool. So in a, you'll see this. And now, if you watch the magic here, I will fold it. And then it is this size. And amazingly, this, this is mine on my refrigerator. So this is, you know, in, anyone who needed to come in to my place would see this pretty quickly. And this has a lot of that information they will need. The meds, who my doctor is, my health insurance, my health insurance agent, et cetera, et cetera. Um, how, where the rest of my documents are. <laughs> so uh, th this you will also get, um, if not next week, the week after. But everyone will get this as well, and hopefully you will um, you will use it. Now, 
This one was going to be the shortest in terms of the presentation. So we have, we have lots of time for Q&A. If we've missed anything in kind of the overarching, why are we here, what's this all about, um, you know, feel free to ask, um, ask now, um, ask later. We are also, um, I'm told it would probably be a good idea to take a break between now and the Q&A session. So we can do that as 10 minutes. Colleen, does 10 minutes seem like a right amount of time for a break? Good break. Oh, I see a Let's see if I can do this. When questions are raised, can I repeat them so everyone can hear? Yes, I can do that. For being on schedule. Take your seats. <clears throat> While everyone is getting seated, I, I've heard from several of you that you would like to have a hard copy of these slides. So next week when you come, we will make sure that everybody is given a hard copy of all these slides. Welcome. And then um, I've also been asked to remind everyone to please silence your cell phones. Okay, so I, I will start. I have five questions in front of me so far, and then we'll open it up and send people around with a microphone to, uh, to do some more. All right, um, I will miss the last session. Um, can I get information about that day emailed to me? Yes, we will, we will make sure that all of these slides will be available for everybody, even if, uh, you know, obviously if you've, certainly if you've paid to come to all four, you'll get them. I am also working, or we are working on making um, the, a video available of this. Um, there are some technical challenges we've got to work through. So I, I have nothing to announce today, um, but we're working on it. That's a good question. What, I could be like Karnak, okay, who can guess what this question is? Um, what if the rules change about wills? How do we find out? Does the attorney or firm contact the user or should we be proactive and question every year? G great question. I, um, Joe, this, this actually might make sense to answer right now because it's, I think it, it's, it's kind of a quick one. Let me get you a microphone. Here, Colleen's got oh, power. Right. Uh, the rules are highly unlikely to change. Highly unlikely. Uh, pretty well, for a standard will, uh, around the world, if it's signed by the will maker or the testator in the presence of two witnesses with all three persons signing in the presence of each other, it's a valid will. So you needn't worry about that. I can assure you, I've been working as a legal practitioner for 45 years. The general rules have never changed. Something, an easy, an easy question. That's awesome. Thank you, Joe. All right, let's see. All 
All right, can Joe please address? So Joe, I'm gonna read this and then the, the, it is perfectly acceptable to say this is part of the presentation on living wills, in which case we'll wait till week three. If it's easy to answer now, then we can answer now. If you hold an Australian, US or other nationality power of attorney for a spouse with Alzheimer's, can you sign all the necessary tie documents on his or her behalf? Probably not. Okay, we all good now? All right. I, I, I need to have to look at the documents, but the general answer is probably not. Uh, specifically, uh, Australia has got a special law that says if you have But if you knew Bruce, you'd know why he was on a motorcycle at age 77. He had three of them. <laughs> maybe, maybe more. Okay. So, so uh, this person had a living will that had been prepared in the states. It met all of it met all of the requirements for a high living will, with the exception that the healthcare representative had not accepted appointment. The doctors were giving the daughter a hard time. They got on the phone to the son. He said, "I know what my dad wants," and uh, ultimately the doctors agreed to accept it. That was Nakon Kim. Wasn't Chiang Mai Ram. Wasn't uh, Ram who were much tougher. But Nakon Kim accepted it. But in general terms, it has to be a Thai living will. Thank you. <coughs> I'm, I'm sure this is my fault, but I'm having trouble reading this. So we're, someone was talking about funeral, bank account, bills, are they responsible financially? Um, so wh whoever, wh who wrote this question, we'll send a microphone out. All right, well, and then you, you can ask it, and I'll make sure I do it right. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to let Joe answer that as well, but I think that the answer is no. All right, so I, the, the question was, if, if someone has been appointed an executor to handle the, uh, the details of, of, the, of, of the execution of the will, can that person be held liable for the financial obligations of the deceased? They will only be liable to the extent of the assets in the estate. They won't be personal. There you go, again, easy one. Oh, all right, so the, so the answer is no, they will not, a, an executor will not be liable for anything beyond the monetary value that's in the estate. So they will not be personally liable. Okay, got it? Okay. Okay, so um, for th this person who says not a question, but for any Australians, who wrote this? Thank you. So um, why don't we let you announce that since you're being helpful? So any helpful people are welcome to talk anytime. Uh, okay, um, Australians might know me. I, my name is Neil Kyler. Uh, I'm a uh, practicing justice of the peace, um, Queensland justice. That for Queensland, uh, Commonwealth, and quite frankly for most other states, in fact, I've never come across a case where it hasn't been accepted. Uh, I can do the standard range of justice of the peace duties, administrative duties. That's um, certifying through copy documents, um, witnessing documents, um, up to and including affidavits, um, property settlements. 
some states don't know which, know which ones. Um, but, uh, but basically, I've seen many hundreds of people here and in my previous places around the world, and there's never been an issue with uh, acceptance of my authority um, or the authority of a Queensland JP for these matters. Um, the, uh, some of you may receive, Australians may receive proof of life certificates, proof of life forms. Um, I can witness those. Uh, if that's an issue, if you're over 80 and you're getting a, 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 a couple of pension, you need to do a proof of life every two years. Uh, the, things, the things that I can't do are um, documents which are required by the Thai government, so Thai immigration. Um, there, that needs to be done um, by the embassy, by the consul, consular function of the embassy. Uh, that's um, certificates of no impediment for marriage and any documents that need to be certified for use for immigration purposes. Um, Thai immigration want to see an embassy stamp on that. Um, I'm free. I'm, my services by law are completely free. Uh, the alternatives uh, aren't, that, aren't that great. Uh, the Australian Embassy now charges $85 per page, $85 Australian dollars per page, that's to be 2,000 baht per page to certify documents. Um, that increases with, with the complexity of the documents. Um, that's about it. If anyone would like to see me briefly when we finish, I can give you a business card, but I'll be here every week as well. Thank you. I, it, it makes me want to tell a, a, a funny story. If you can't laugh at yourself, and I, I do often laugh at myself. So he used a word there, affidavit. And uh, any of you remember an old, old, old TV show called Perry Mason? Okay. So when Perry Mason was on, I, I might have been in, you know, 10 years old or something. And that was the first time I ever heard that word, affidavit. And I, I, my parents loved telling this story that I kept asking, who, who is this guy David, and, and what is he half about? <laughs> so, anyway, okay, enough now thinking of me. All right, that is all the written questions I have. Who has more questions? I have one right here. We have a microphone for this fine looking gentleman right here. I, that's what I count on. Thank you. In some jurisdictions, a living will has no legal um, basis. What is the situation here in Australia? Joe. Uh, the living will has uh, a legal basis in Thailand. It was brought in by a, a regulation under the Health Care Act, I think it's called. Uh, and it, it, if you comply with the requirements of a living doctor is required to act in accordance with your health care representative's instructions, and in doing so he is indemnified against any liability he might otherwise have. A living will does not authorise euthanasia. Euthanasia. That doesn't authorise youth in Africa either. Uh, <laughs> I'm here all week, okay? All right, all right. Okay, all right. Hi, Suzanne. What, what is the difference between an executor of the will and a power of attorney? Ooh. Joe, can I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to try this. I'm, I'm going to try this, Joe, and if I screw it up, you can save me. All right. A, a power of attorney grants certain rights to someone else to act in your behalf. And I think that that only lasts until you die. I mean, once you die, there's no power of attorney anymore. The executor is the person who is given the responsibility to administer, to do, to, to cause all things to happen that are in your will. So for example, closing your bank accounts, um, you know, taking care of your lease, um, just you know, making sure all the stuff in the will actually happens. 
Yes, they, they can be the, they could be the same human being, but there are two different things. How they do? Right. Uh -huh. The power of attorney ceases on death, absolutely. <laughs> a will only comes into play upon death. Uh, but the executor has no power to do anything under law until he's appointed by a court order. He or she. Okay, coming back. Oh. I think that the power of attorney is only when you are alive. The power of attorney is only when you are alive. Once you die, that's when the executor comes into play. Correct? Yeah, well, the executor, you can choose who your executor is. They. You can choose who your executor is, but once you die, that's when Colleen, behind you. There you go. Uh, most of them were saying that the executor has no power until he is appointed by the court. Um, does this mean that what has to happen is that the executor will take the will to a lawyer or the court or something and then get, get the court to, to authorize it? Yes, briefly, that's right, but nothing simple in Thailand. You've got money in the bank and you take a death certificate and a will. Australian banks, or, or, or banks throughout the Western world, as long as it's not an excessive amount, will say, we'll give you the money in accordance with the will, as long as you give us an indemnity uh, against any claims of the sales claim by anyone else. In Thailand, the banks regard the death of a foreigner as a windfall. They will not give the money, they will say, go and get a court order. And in Thailand, it's much, much more difficult to get a court order than in most Western countries. I'll, I'll deal with it in detail. Uh, next slide. And part, part of what, uh, so what, what Joe said is obviously absolutely correct. Um, he and, and any other capable of attorney will also be able to advise you on you know, some ways to more pragmatically deal with those circumstances. So um, it, is, it doesn't necessarily 100% positively all the time have to wait for a court order. My name is not Rick Hahn. Okay. Okay. Next. Can I think I actually know this question. Yes. Oh, can can one of the beneficiaries of the will also be the executor? And the answer is yes. And often is. And often is. So this might have a bit of a strange beginning. You know, where's the best place to die? And by that, what do I mean is, someone has said, if you die, stay in your home. The paperwork and all that bureaucracy can be quite uh, overbearing. I've heard that if you pass in a hospital or in a place like the apartment, they're able to facilitate all the paperwork in a way that there is absolutely truth to that. Um, sadly, we're not always able to accomplish doing that exactly how we wanted. But yes, um, and Heather Smith will talk very specifically about that on um, uh, two weeks from today. But yes, there, there are folks that are you know, very used to dealing with those circumstances and the paperwork involved. And, um, and and it, it, it can be a big deal, but it's also you know part of having you know in your plan. It can be far less onerous if 
you, know, you, you have a plan and people know how to go about executing that plan, you know, even if you're at home. Uh, before I forget, <clears throat> I, I was approached by two people who, who I, I trust a, as having the right motivation who asked me, do you think there would be any interest in somewhere, someone offering a service like on an hourly basis to help people create their plans? and to kind of walk through um, you know, all, all of the steps. Um, and I said, I don't know. So my question of all of you is if any of you think, yeah, I, I, that, that's a decent idea. Um, if you would, just jot that, you know, jot me a quick note at media at changmyexpatsclub.com. And, um, and if there is enough interest, maybe we'll, we'll try to, to do that. Um, also, on, on the same lines, remember earlier I talked a little bit about the uh, I'm OK line group. It, it also occurred to me the other day that it might be really valuable for, I mean, let's just say that this group got together one, once a month. And we got together, and the whole idea was to talk about our experiences. You know, how's it going um, in, in preparing these plans? What was easy? What wasn't? Who, who was able to be helpful? Who wasn't? Um, and, and I thought, you know, that might be a really good idea. So another thing to let me know about is, um, you know, w would you be interested if we started such a group? And again, very, just very pragmatic to, you know, how do you go about getting the stuff that we're talking about in these sessions, how to get it done. So again, let me know. Good question. I've had occasion to deal with my bank in Canada, which is one of the big three banks, so it's not a small bank. And the legal affairs department refused to accept a notarized statement whether it was certified by the, the consulate here or the embassy. Uh, they refused any notarized uh, statement uh, issued by anybody that wasn't a notary certified in Canada, which meant that I would have to attend the signing of, of uh, the certificate in Canada with the notary. So my question is, if, if, if they have that kind of power to, to signing my, my wishes when I'm alive, what happens when I'm dead? Can the, does the executor and the will from, from Thailand have more suasion on the bank to comply with account closures, transfers, uh, monies being paid out to, to people in Canada that I might deem uh, to inherit from me? Joe, you want to take a stab at that? Question. Yes, so um, the, the question is, this gentleman has banking relationships in Canada and the Canadian banks are putting off all sorts of roadblocks in terms of not accepting um, the Thai version of notarized documents, etc. So the question is, is there, uh, and, and, and obviously it's a problem enough while he's alive and can represent himself but it, it potentially even worse uh, if he's not here. So the question is how to deal with that circumstance. Do I, do I get it? Banks generally are becoming more and more unreasonable with their requirements. Um, it doesn't surprise me what you've seen in Canada. Uh, dealing with the issue of Thai notaries, uh, Neil will be aware of this. Uh, the Thai notary system has no legislative base to it not by statute, therefore doesn't really legally exist. It's just set up by their, their law institute or whatever. The Queensland Land Office is aware of this and they won't accept any documents signed by a Thai notary. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me that other countries might know that as well. Uh, but going back to the situation in the event of death, uh, the, the Canadian bank won't accept an order made by court in Thailand. 
you would have to get uh, either probate or administration in Canada, and uh, that has the authority of, I don't know what the court is called there, presumably the Supreme Court, and the bank is required to act in accordance with the uh, lawful authority by the court given to the executive. So just to repeat uh, the answer, so I think what you're saying, Joe, is that it, this is an issue that's going to have to be dealt with in, in, in Canada. So you have to get a notarized in in a Canadian, uh, yeah, in, no, 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 or part of a Canadian there will. There would have to be, there's assets in Thailand and Canada, there would have to be, assuming there's a will, there'd have to be an order here appointing an executor, and additionally there would have to be a grant of probate in Canada appointing the executor who would then have the authority of the court to act for the estate. And the bank would have to accept that. Not an easy, quick answer, but did you get the answer you were looking for? I have a, a question. Perhaps not. Oh, there we are. Sorry. But I have these documents in the U.S. Uh, if I were to die here, could you say briefly what would happen? So I'll give you the in English lay version of that, and then Joe will correct me. So essentially, your Thai, you need a Thai will to deal with Thai assets. And your, your Thai will will not carry any sway in another country, and your will in another country is unlikely to have much sway here. So that's, that's the general answer in English. Is there anything today that we need to clarify? If you have assets in several countries, you have to you need a will in each of those countries. That's that answer all the questions. That's not strictly right, but it's often a good idea to have wills in. If you have assets in various jurisdictions, it's often wise to have wills in different jurisdictions. For the purposes of Thai law, there's a provision in Thai Civil and Commercial Code that says that a will is valid made by a foreigner if one, it complies with the law in Thailand, and two, if it complies with the law of the country of the uh, foreign nationality. So an overseas will can be valid. But you should not assume that it is just because it's valid in that other country. Yeah, you'd have to prove that it's valid in that other country. Yes. Uh, pertaining to the, uh, the money in the Maryland uh, bank accounts, if you already uh, filed for foreign with banks such as with Charles Schwab, they're called pay, pay on debt, you know, where, you, where you designate a beneficiary right there in the bank, uh, is there a problem with the payout to the person that designates? Yeah, I think the answer to that is no, but, but you still, oh, the, the, so the, the, the question is, let's say you're in another country and his example is the United States, and you have an account with a U.S. bank, and you've already completed paperwork that, as he described it, is you know, payable upon death. So, um, so if, if you then subsequently die, will there be any problem having whoever is designated to get that money to get the money. And they, you know, the, the easy answer is you still have to prove to the U.S. jurisdiction um, like the, the equivalent of the death certificate, et cetera. So with, with that, I'll let Joe describe how that happens. I can, I can, I can answer that. Oh. All right. Ah, there we go. All right. I, I, Julie. Can, I, can, I can answer that. I've dealt with that. Um, if you have payable on death on your on your accounts in the U.S., then all you have to do is email them a death certificate. Generally, the embassy will provide you with ten copies. They have lots of copies. They can, for me, they can even require an original. I just email it to them, and everything will be paid out. You, you look pretty much alive to me. Yeah, I know, but yeah. unfortunately, my spouse is not. 
Thank you, Tilly. That answer your question? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. So, so next next week's session on wills will be a you know a pretty deep dive. I mean, the, the idea is to make sure. That my my goal after next week is to make sure that all of you know what what a will needs to be and needs to not be. Also, to how to have it. Joe, Joe introduced me to a phrase that there's. I think, and, and I hope I don't butcher this. There is no such thing as a simple will, but you can make your will simple. And he, he will explain that and, and what that means and how uh, some strategies to make sure that the will will work um, you know, as, as easily and efficiently as possible. So that's, that's the entire session next week is going to be on wills, and it'll, it'll be pretty deep dive. Um, just, uh, just going back to the issue about Canada, there is a full Canadian consulate in Chiang Mai, um, last time I checked. They're discussing the Canadian consulate not accepting the uh, Thai notary law. So, uh, so an, institu an institution in Canada won't accept notarization by their own embassy. They're they're um, they're discussing the issue we talked about a little little earlier with the Canadian banks not accepting. Uh, Thai notaries, and then in addition, the new information we got is that they won't accept uh, anything notarized from the United States or any other country. So they're just uh, uh, clarifying that we, you know, one would in fact have to get a Canadian notary to deal with the Canadian banks. And just briefly expanding on something that Joe said before about Thai notaries, if you see on a document that it requires a notary public to sign the document, um, there are no internationally recognized notary publics in Thailand. Thailand's not a signatory to the International Convention on Epistle. So, um, uh, and again, some, some, for some purposes, a Thai lawyer, notary, will be accepted. But um, in many cases, it, it won't be, um, simply because of those factors. As Joe said, there's no legislative basis to a Thai notary, be called notary. And they're not a convention, and they're not a signatory to the International Convention on Notary. Thank you. Anyone else? Just one small point to add to your checklist. I'm only here today, I won't be in it if you have any questions, so I'll, I'll launch it now. And that is uh, pain medication is a big part of your living will. Many, many doctors I was negligent and I've witnessed this firsthand, both personally and in my job for a long time, that doctors will let their personal uh, views and philosophies prevail over the patient's best interest when it comes to the medication for pain. And for those here that have ever experienced serious levels of pain, uh, death is probably a welcome uh, alternative. So, but if pain can be mitigated with, with, with drugs, for example, uh, some that might be addictive, uh, some hospitals, some doctors will not, will not administer to the dying patient, which is ridiculous. The doctor has no right to, to obstruct the medication, but there's no way for, especially in Thailand, because doctors are next to God, uh, that, that you can get that overridden unless it's a patient's own, own uh, say-so. And the living will would be the place to put that. And it's in mind. Uh, and it probably should be front and center of, of any living will because who wants to go to serious levels of pain? 
You won't do it to a dog. Yep. Absolutely true. Did, did everyone catch that? All right, so Joe's going to clarify. There's a standard question in the uh, living will in giving instructions to your health care representative, and it asks, uh, do you want to have the maximum amount of pain relief committed by law? I've never had a client who doesn't say yes. Sorry, what? Repeat the end. Every living will I've ever done uh, authorizes the health care representative to instruct the doctor to give the maximum amount of pain relief permitted by law. The doctor has to comply and he's indemnified against any liability he might otherwise have in compliance. I think the, the importance of this exchange was to, to make sure to realize that without the living will, then you are at completely at the discretion of the doctor. The doctor will do what the doctor wants to do, which and what he want, he or she wants to do may be colored by their own personal beliefs, their religious affiliations, etc. So the, the point being that if you want to make sure that you're treated the way you want to be treated, it's important to have the living will so that you can codify and specify how you want to be treated. It's also, uh, and I agree with that entirely, it's also important here, and I won't be talking about specific hospitals, but it's also uh, important to select an appropriate hospital. Yeah, let, let me... The healthcare representative will give the instructions in accordance with his or her authority under the law. Person selected by the person making the living will. And that person has to accept the point. So l let's explore that for just a quick second. So, what Joe said is um, that he, he's not able to talk about specific hospitals. But if you, if you ask around, it won't take you long to, do, to find out that some hospitals. Um, are, are easier to deal with on these issues than others. Some hospitals also have their own proprietary form for a living will. And I, I don't think I'm getting in any trouble if I say that Bangkok Hospital is one of those that has their own form. Um, so uh, Joe's point was that you know, should you have a choice uh, of your healthcare facility that you will be entering, you know, it might be wise to understand, you know, what their specific requirements are relative to uh, living will. Are you implying that Bangkok Hospital won't accept your own? Are you implying that Bangkok Hospital won't accept your form because they have their own? I, I think. The best answer I can give you is that it's not a slam dunk that they will. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting, a, I'm not saying a word. Um, so, so I must be close. I, I, I see the look of confusion on your face. Um, I, I, I understand. I. I I was confused myself when I first heard that. So I guess the, the best thing that I would say from my lay perspective is, you know, I mean, Bangkok Hospital is a great hospital. So I mean, if that's where you want to get your care, then I think it's probably important to talk to them ahead of time and find out what their um, you know, advanced directive and living will form is. And then, you know, obviously if you have if you have one um, that's, say, done by your attorney, it would be very easy to, to transfer, you know, not transfer that, but to have that same document with uh, the Bangkok Hospital letterhead as well. Uh, yes, that's a question about the electric hospital. I asked one, it's called Stokoman, and they told me, well, you can only fill it out when you are in the hospital. And I said, that's quite late. I said, it's <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, 
but that was some time ago, okay? So uh, I haven't gone to Alpha anymore, so I think that. So that, um, that's the only one that I got. The, 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 the issue that Ava just brought up is that she was told at a particular hospital that you, you could only fill out a living will once you were in the hospital. And my, my guess is that um, whoever told her that you know, gave her in, incorrect information. Um, we, we, can all, we could all today um, you know, talk to a, a professional and, and you know, create a, a, a living will. It is, not, it is not a terribly complex document. It's a very important one that you gotta make sure you get right. But it, it is something that, you know, you, you, I, I think anyone in here who is familiar with any of this would say you're far better off to have it before you get to the hospital than, uh, than to wait till you're there. Ladies and gentlemen, Marie. Hi. We mentioned dying at home. Uh, this is a true story. About six years ago, a man died in our condo, and the juristic person, um, I, I was there, so I know firsthand. The juristic person said, we cannot have him declared dead in his apartment. He must be taken by ambulance to the hospital and declared dead there because we don't want his ghost staying in the condo. Yeah, and this is true. Whether you die at home, whatever, get that body to an emergency room, to a hospital, and be declared dead there. It takes a lot of paperwork for the you know, residents, and uh, this handles problems. Uh, similar story, I, I assume you probably will hear that since you did speak into the microphone. I heard the same thing from a, a guy who runs one of the real estate services here that, you know, if you want to rent a house or buy a house, you go to these services. And he said, he said that the reason why they, they typically charge, um, you know, so much for the security deposit is that they, they can't. They can't get the cleaners to go into the house if someone's died there. Um, so they have to get a separate crew in um, and, and to, to get the religious people in to clear the ghosts out before the cleaning folks will go in. So again, these, these are cultural issues that um, you know, seem uh, uh, you know, interesting to some of us, but that, that makes them no less real for the people that, you know, that, that live with them. So um, these, these are you know, real live issues. All right, we, we are right at noon. I don't, I don't mean to throw anybody out, so if there are more questions, you know, if, you, if you need to leave, it's noon. Thank you all for coming. I'm glad it was great. We look forward to seeing you next week. And um, feedback welcome. And anyone who needs to stay to get more information, feel free. Thank you all.